Efraim. Tá passando, gente? Porque para mim não tá aparecendo nada, mas talvez. Yes. Tá passando, sim. Tá. Tá. Hum. Mim... Estamos no Face também. Já estamos, né? Tempo. Olá. Oi, Adriane. Que bom te ver. Oi, Fernanda. Ju. Tudo bem? Oi, Adri. Ai, Ai, oi, Mônica. Que cabelo, viu? Adorei, adorei, adorei. Hum. adorei. Oi, oi, estamos bom. parecidas de cabelo. Isso. Boa noite. Boa noite, gente. Davi. Hi, Davi. Oi, Edna. Oi. Mike, Edna, oi, was our... Oi, Edna. Speak for our first one, Edna. Edna was also with us in the first meeting this year. So it was great to have you. Pilar. Muito bom, gente. Andy. Good evening, Andy. Good evening. Lá de manhã, Duda. Pessoal, é, a, já vamos começar a dar algumas regrinhas. Nós já estamos também no Facebook, para quem quiser e, precisa, e não conseguir entrar, poder entrar. E aqui a gente tem legenda. Para vocês colocarem legenda, é muito simples. É só ir aqui no, na parte de baixo do Zoom, num lugar onde está escrito legenda ou closed caption. Aí vocês só clicam ali e diz permitir close caption, não sei exatamente como é que está em português, é view, view full transcript, vai aparecer tudo do lado. Ou então, show subtitle, é alguma coisa assim, tá? Em português, mostrar subtítulo. Lari, você está digitando aí? Só para a gente, para o pessoal poder ver se está enxergando aí. Tá? É, também, a, gente, a gente tem a Larissa... A Viviane e a Isabela vão fazer esse, esse trabalho de colocar le, legenda para a gente. A gente tem é, o Everton, que está fazendo a interpretação em Libras, só para vocês entenderem o que está que acontecendo aqui. Então, quem precisar de Libras, a gente também tem aqui essa possibilidade, tá? Infelizmente, não dá para falar em português e em espanhol, mas o pessoal do espanhol pode tentar fazer aí Vamos entender o português. O que, que é, Elias? O que, que o Elias pediu aí? Que eu não entendi, gente. Para liberar o, o intérprete, Dani. Ah, alguém pode... É a Daniela, alguém pode liberar para ela? Gente, lá, ela já está aí, a Daniela? Oi, entrei, entrei. Legal, Dani. Vê, o Everton, para mim, não está marcado aí para você, tá? Eu vou colocar um pin no Everton. No, no Everton, pra... Mas vocês tirem, pode pôr em galeria, mas ele só vai ficar na frente. Agora sim. Eu vou pedir para todo mundo, se puder, colocar no mudo durante o momento de apresentação, a gente vai ficar no mudo. Depois aí a gente pode entrar, é, é, quando for na hora da conversa, todo mundo pode abrir, perguntar e tal e tal. A gente vai procurar fazer o mais conversacional possível. Lu, já vou te colocar de volta. É, eu queria dizer para as pessoas que estão assistindo pelo Facebook também boas-vindas. Acho que a gente pode começar? Dois minutos? Eu vou começar só para fal falando. Então, só de novo, se alguém puder de, de, de colocar o, 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 o bilhete aí para as pessoas que têm subtítulos, que têm legenda, que é só colocar aqui embaixo, aí eu acho que era legal. Vivi Bom, colocou. Vivi colocou? Beleza. Então, gente. Eu vou mudar então para o inglês agora para poder incluir o nosso, nosso convidado, tá? É, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very, very happy to have all of you here with us today. It's a pleasure that we can, we can share this moment, we can have this, this opportunity to, to be together and have a chance to somehow um, find at this very difficult moment we are going through a chance to celebrate life and celebrate the opportunity to 
to be with the other, even if it's a dis in a distant way. Um, I would like to say as an organizer and the leader of the research group LASI together with Cecilia Magalhães, who is also here, we are very pleased to have you all. Um, I want to say that our research group has a very long Vygotskyan tradition, but our reading of Vygotsky comes also with the reading of Freire and all the Latin America um, perspective of of liberation. So the idea is that we can think about this moment, not only as a moment for us to, do, to think about research, but most of all for us to think about what, it is the, what is it that we are going through as people in the world, as in, in days that we read every day, a lot of people dying, 3,000 people dying every day. What is our what is our response to this as researchers, as people in the world? And in our group, our response is we have to resist and to expand. And uh, it, this thing that we are doing here now is a form of resisting and expanding. So I would like to thank um, all the people, all our guests, Edna, who was here with us three weeks ago. Uh, last week, we had also the opportunity to discuss with Katerina and today with Mike, next week with Andy, who is here also. So I'm very pleased and very happy that you are here with us. So thank you very much. These seminars, they are being organized not only by me, but also by my, my, my supervisees, my postdoctoral supervisees. And today, the organization of this seminar is in charge, Monica is in charge of the organization of this seminar. So I will pass to Monica the, 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 the whole of the discussion and I will just enjoy it. So enjoy yourselves, have a lot of fun, and thank you very much for all of you for being here sharing with us. Monica. Thank you, Faye. Uh, thank you, Mike, for being here. Thank you again. I will be very brief in my introductions and then I'll pass the word to Mike, who I think has many things to exchange with us. I'll ask you guys to mute your mics, please. Um, I'll, as I said, I'll make a brief introduction. So Mike, if you would like to add anything later, feel free to do so. So uh, Michael Cole is an emeritus and distinct, distinguished professor at University of California, San Diego. He's also the founder of the Laboratory of Comparative Human Cognition. Uh, I know I, I first knew Mike by this book here. And I think many of you were the same. Um, Mike is also a member of the USA and National Academy of Education and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Mike was, has been the editor of Mind, Culture and Activity. He's the founder also of the list of XMCA in which we, we've been following for, for many years. Uh, Mike has worked with Andy, who is also here in, in the lab of human cognition, comparative human cognition. He has also worked with Udyo in the past, who was supposed to be here with us, uh, actually by Mike's suggestion. Mike suggested that we could have this back and forward discussion like moving this historicity of chat. But unfortunately, Udyo cannot be here with us because of the time difference. In Helsinki now is midnight 37. So it would be too late for him to come. We are actually trying to check and if, he, if we can have this meeting again to move forward with this discussion, maybe in June, but let's see how things progress. Uh, recently, well, I first met Mike in 2006. We had an attempt to have a, a meeting with our research group. And that time the technology wasn't so good, isn't it fair? And then <laughs> it was very hard. We went to a theater, to the Catholic, Catholic University Theater, and it was a very brief conversation and it wasn't, we weren't so successful. But today we are much closer. There are the benefits of technology. And I've been working with Mike since last October, I think, in the organization of cultural practices. I think Mike has 
a lot to say about it as well. So um, I'm very grateful for you, Mike, to, for being here, for accepting our invitation. And what is the most important for us is what we've been doing, how we think the, this discussion we have been going through, the historicity of chat and how we can move forward. How can we uh, think about the future in terms of chat in like in this multi-voicedness process, uh, as Fernanda started saying, we've been studying Vygotsky for quite a long time. Cisa Magalhães, Maria Cecilia Magalhães, who is here, she started studying Vygotsky in the 90s. And she is the one who brings us the tradition that we call today formative interventions, but she is the one who targeted the name uh, critical collaborative research, which is a form of formative interventions and how we look, how we move forward with, as I said, multi-voicedness and also considering these struggles, this kind of struggles we've been through, these uh, oppositions of views and um, such tough times, not only regar regarding the pandemics, but also regarding the polit political situations, how we communicate, how we work with education and so on and so forth. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, audience, for watching us. Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. And thanks to everybody for uh, coming and visiting. So what I'm going to try to do today is to um, cover a couple of topics uh, and leave time for answering your questions and for opening up the topics of most interest to you. Monica, you want to... Uh, somewhere here, I can turn this into this. Uh, can you all see my slides now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. So um, let me start here. Um, I want to, in the spirit that, uh, that Monica and um, Fernanda have spoken of trying to acknowledge the situation that we're in, in the world in general, and in each of our countries. Um, and I'm just listing things here. It should be, I don't, if everybody can read English or otherwise Monica, you could just read these points. I think they're clear to everybody. I just want to set this as a context, right? So that there's a crisis of governability, there's civil unrest, national instabilities, there's the pandemic, there's climate change, which makes all of it worse. There's the massive social inequalities, refugees from war, poverty, disease, fascism, all of this stuff all coming to us at once. And then we have this new historical shift, I think a turning point is maybe a singularity even, uh, that is associated with digitalization and the uh, wonders of science. And then finally, my own deepest fear about all of this as an old person is that this situation retains many of the characteristics that we saw in the 1930s that led to the Second World War, which is when I was born. So all of these things make, uh, I think, our global situation uh, obviously fraught, and each of us is fighting with this situation in our own countries where there are different manifestations of the same overall kind of crisis of humanity. Is that okay, Monica, I should just continue slowly like that, that? Okay. So here I'm focusing on the problem of generational change. And I'm thinking about this with respect to chat or cultural historical psychology or activity theory or any of those intellectual movements of the 20th century that we draw upon. 
that with respect to cultural historical psychology and, and activity theory, we have no more direct contact with the post-World War II generation of people in Moscow, Kharkov, and other parts of the Soviet Union. No Troika, no Davidov, no Zinchenko, Kravtsova, or Bruner, or Braun from Brenner, or Ferreri, or Fanon, right? They're in texts now and in the discourse. Then there's, I think, very important in my own understanding of the current situation in the United States, I can't speak for elsewhere, is that the struggles here associated with the civil rights movement uh, have been replaced in this generation by younger people who are completely fed up with neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism, and racism, but they're confronting a reinvigorated fascism and totalitarianism. So in some ways, what old people like me have to say is irrelevant. I am simply cannot be radical enough for those circumstances, right? On the other hand, I've seen this before. So maybe there's something to learn from the earlier generation who saw an earlier face of the same phenomena. Maybe. You, you have to decide that. I can't decide it for you. So from my point of view now, oh, I didn't mean to go up. Let me do, go back up. So from my point of view, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to do is this. Yes, okay. So fr from my point of view, the challenge now is to combine the different streams of history of cultural, historical, and activity theories and regenerate the critical project of human development that this movement represented in the 30s, in the 40s, and up to this time. Uh, uh, and I take it that the, this kind of seminar that you're running is central to this kind of work. And, I, and what uh, Fernanda said at the beginning, just reinforce that belief. We understand that. I think these are common ideas. Now, I asked you to read one article thinking that I was going to be doing this jointly with Uria. And I want, and there are questions from the article. And so I wanted in what I say to finish up here is to draw on the article. So these are some of the points from what critical theory were we thinking of in 19... 1998 or something when we started to write all of this uh, that we were writing within a tradition from the discipline of communication not psychology and for us the frankfurt school was an extremely important watermark in the benchmark in the development of our discipline but from this general understanding from marx to the present of all the critical theories that we pay attention to critical of capitalist societies, the exploitation of working classes, critical of racism and social exclusion, critical of the education system that perpetuates and amplifies the problems. Then we draw explicitly on Adorno and the notion of utopian methodology is related to his critique. Adorno quite explicitly scorned reformist efforts to create basic change. He said they'd either be crushed if they started to work or they'd simply be appropriated and become a part of the problem. So if you follow that, why waste time with curriculum reform? It's a waste of time. Or Henry Giroux, who worked on, focused on transforming relations between theory and practice as a way to engage in some sort of critical activity that comes close to the idea of a, uh, uh, a positive critical theory that is in that paper. Then Mary Bryce and Susan Castell, feminists focused on transformations in technologies that mediate work, education and community life. And then Elizabeth Stuckey, who was smart enough to understand the violence of literacy 
and the way in which literacy programs are designed to fail. So these are things that were very much in our minds at the time we wrote this. Then you have cultural historical activity theory. I think the basic impulse is to reject a choice between activity and mediation, between Leontiev uh, and Vygotsky. Okay, uh, and that these two sides of human life co-constitute human life. They're not antimonies, not opposites. The basic challenge is to develop insights gained from such a broader, more inclusive framework to support the critical goals of transformation that's derived from the critiques. Now, there are different traditions of pursuing chat, as you've been finding out. They've arisen depending upon their national traditions, the objects of analysis, the disciplinary concerns, the domains of practice. I'd add the particular political strategies that people wanted to use. All of these face a major problem of moving from these abstract descriptions of way things should be to rising to the concrete, to taking the abstractions and embodying them in everyday life. The other document you were given was Uriah's 2009 summary of principles and prospects of uh, chat. And I, uh, what I have to say, I, because he's not here, I don't think it's appropriate for us really to focus on that at that level of things. And uh, as uh, I think Monica said, we hope that we'll be able to get together and think about the historicity of chat itself but I don't want to be univoiced about something that's or mono voiced about something that's minimally dialogic and polylogical. So what I'm going to do is just quickly summarize the idea of uh, a positive critical theory and its, its accompanying parts. And uh, then I'll turn to questions. So the basic idea of positive critical theory is to say it's not enough to criticize. One also has to demonstrate the efficacy of one's alternatives. Now, you can do that as a revolutionary trying to knock over a government, but that's, I'm not going to be doing that and neither are you probably, at least not as uh, uh, academics. Uh, and this idea uh, is not new with me, uh, although I didn't know that at the time we coined the phrase, but Richard Rorty, for example, talks about the test of an oppositional pedagogy is not what it opposes, but what it pro proposes, not how well it deconstructs, but how well it reconstructs. I think that's, that's right. So, the basic challenge is to design and implement an alternative pedagogy, pedagogy that is neither crushed nor trivial. Sustainability of such an alternative becomes a criterion for uh, truth claims about what it is that you're doing and criteria for success and for failure. So, if you have a theory, then you, of course, have to have an appropriate methodology. That's straight from Vygotsky. Uh, and uh, part of thinking about what I'm calling mesogenetic methodology uh, is the understanding that short-term studies, snapshots of a small piece of the beginning of a process are not sufficient for you to understand the processes of change in a way that you can take advantage of them. So I want to push the idea of mesogenetic. Mesogenetic is, I should have written this down, is between, if you like, it's always between, it's meso, but in this case, between micro and macro of some sort, there's a meso uh, scale. And that meso in between for educational pro intervention projects is, something that is, from my point of view, uh, has to begin very early in the process and follow the process all the way through. So in the Brown and Cole paper, we said kind of how you begin and what the major stages are. 
identify the problem to be solved, a problem that presumably is not a purely academic problem that you're pushing on the community, but is a problem that is identified by participation in the community. We do this kind of work with a year of goal formation, just talking with people about the opportunities to solve whatever problem they have that they share with you in some way so you can work on it together. Then co-design a presumed solution and, and be sure to include those who are responsible for the community in which the problems are being felt. Implement the solution. It could be a Ferrari style curriculum. It could be a fifth dimension. It could be funds of knowledge. It could be any kind of program of that sort that you like. Then you need, of course, to evaluate it. Evaluate it for yourself, but evaluate it for your community by some sort of methods. And in the paper, we talk about methods that we could use to do that. And then we have conduct failure analysis, I think you could call it. Uh, that is really stick it to yourself. Give yourself a hard time about what your wrong ideas are where you went wrong, what you could be doing better. Now, let me on the next slides, just spell those ideas out a little bit, and then we'll go to discussion. So any methodology requires an assembly of methods, a logic of the methods that you're using that connect your theory and your data. From the, what we're, the we've approach we've taken, I've abstracted these points. You want multiple levels of analysis. You, that is, you want it to be very micro and you want it to be more macro. I say that, that within that sort of uh, multiple levels of analysis, the idea of cognitive ethnographies, if you like, or they could be teaching learning ethnographies, use a variety of kinds of methods. Mm -hmm. Ethnography, discourse analysis, video recording, quasi-experimental research, and so on. Second, what are the units of analysis? Now, Uriya would be, I think, used to talking about unit of analysis. But I think here, the kinds of units that you have to deal with, at least pragmatically, and I think uh, theoretically as well, are units that are at different levels of institutional organization. That is, for me, the central unit is joint mediated human activity, but that can be of two people trying to uh, solve a problem with pencil and paper, or that can be uh, the Liberality Lab trying to solve problems of equity and language. Um, there's the issue of temporal extension. From my point of view, the unit of analysis must include time. There has to be time in that unit and it has to be represented in some way. Temporal extension. Now, an important point is that part of the project that you're engaged in, ideally, is shorter than the lives of the people who are trying to study it. It may not be, it doesn't have to be as long as there's an institution of researchers that on a single form of joint activity that is stabilized through institutional organizational means. Think of the space program and the project of colonizing the moon, right? So think of the Chartres Cathedral, which takes a hundred years to, to make. People who started it and had the idea, long gone. So it, it's a long process. If you want to end it, it's best to have been there to witness the whole, in some sense, to observe the whole thing. My use of this utopian goal. The reason you need a utopian goal is you need clear, not just uh, statistical significance, but you're making a claim that if you create a certain kind of alternative world, people will be different, will be transformed in that world, that you can make the impossible possible. So you need a goal like that 
because you're going to need it to criticize yourself and have the criterion of, uh, of, of a feedback mechanism so that you can be oriented in the right direction. And then you need that failure analysis. That is ways of doing retrospective analysis of the entire process of development from conception to death, a developmental reconstruction. So just a couple of things here. <clears throat> These are tied together. This is a representation of- Mike, Mike, sorry for interrupting. Uh, I know you're in the middle of your thinking, but Fernanda no, needs done. to- I, I'm at the end. I'm okay. at the end. Because Fernanda this needs exactly to change. It's, this is the end. Okay, Fernanda, can you wait to change? No, no, go ahead. I'll just do this later. Change. Okay, because change. she needs to change the person who is in charge of no the problem. subtitles. No problem. No Thank problem. You. Isa, it's up to you now. Okay. Okay, Mike, thank you. These are graphic illustrations. The sit you're talking about the develop the system that I'm talking about the development of is called a fifth dimension. You analyze it left with the circles at the levels of analysis in a picture you've drawn, I'll show you a picture like that. And it goes over time. And it's that kind of functional system within the sort of general social ecology of human behavior that you're trying to understand. This idea of levels of context, this is straight from Braun from Brenner, different people's interpretations of how you think about the levels of context in studies of human development. So one is a temporal dimension and the other is this kind of synchronic spatial dimension. Now, I think what I'm going to do at this point is to stop and I can pull up other examples, but I thought I would take a few minutes to answer the question of what has happened to the fifth dimension and then answer any other questions. I've read the ones from today and I can share those on the screen if people would like. I'm turning this over to you. Tell me what you want to do now, please. Well, I, I think it could be a nice idea to share the questions, the group questions. Okay. And then meanwhile, people, the audience could think of other questions and type them either on our chat in Zoom or on the Facebook uh, page, Brincadas. And then uh, we will be in charge, Viv Viviane Carrijo will send the questions to me and I'll be taking care of the questions here on Zoom. Okay, uh, right at the moment, of course, I've gone and lost the questions which I had I selected. Do you, uh, let me see if I have them here. I can open them here if you oh, wish. Oh, hold on, just a second. Uh, yes, why don't you open them there? And uh, do I need to stop sharing or can you just take over? Okay. You can take over, Monique. You just. Okay, so the, the first question is the notion of positive in positive critical theory. And I've not described the fifth dimension. I can describe the, and I should put up a, 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 a graph or a, a figure on the general logic of, of uh, institutional change that we were trying to create. Uh, but for the moment, I hope that the question of positive critical theory is clearer. It's a way of theorizing one's activities, change activities, as, let's say as an educator, because I'm thinking of it as an educator, which goes beyond the critique to create an alternative, to demonstrate that the alternative, if you can implement it, creates the change kinds of changes that you would hope to change, and then continue to sustain it, try to sustain it. And as you try to sustain it, you will learn all of the things that were wrong, that made your good idea 
exist only in a tiny ecological niche. And it will lead you directly to the, now the social critique of, well, why can't we get the resources for this? What do we have to do to make this very special way of doing things? How can we make it go viral? How can we make it more general? So that's the idea and to criticize yourself. That's why it relates to the issue down on the third question about failure analysis. My criticism of much of the research that I see that claims great things for transformations uh, does it only in restricted environments, this applies to myself, in only in restricted environments, but uh, they stop doing it and, and have no way to understand, uh, to do a critique of their understanding of its, the environment in order to know what changes have to be brought about. Uh, and there's always a question of, well, any change I make will just be appropriated. That's correct. So you have to keep the struggle. <laughs> You're doing this kind of research as a struggle. All right, um, I wanna skip well, with the Giroux question. Uh, I will send separately. I think that there's a lot of connections. Uh, Giroux had very similar, a lot of these people have very similar ideas, very interesting ideas. And I'm saying whatever ones of these you want to pick on and use it to design your alternative, an alternative you think can win acceptance so that you can maintain it and make it expand and have it expand, uh, that all of these should be done as in terms of the sort of recipe, if you like, or the script of the kind of positive critical work that I was promoting. So here's the question in number three of how the fifth dimension is today and how it dealt with the pandemic. So in order to, just a second, in order to, oh, how to get that? What I, what I would like to, what I'd like to do now is to get back to showing you uh, the UC links page to show you what's happened to the fifth dimension. And I'm gonna be, it's be difficult for me if I can't do that. Uh, how do I get access here? I don't know. Because Monica is sharing, so we you have to take yeah, the share. Yeah, I don't button. know how I can stop. There is no stop sharing. There is new share, Fe. So, so click. Let me will see. this will stop the other screen from sharing. Do you want to continue? Shall I stop you? Yes. 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 Better. Okay, you shouldn't be sharing anymore. Oh, let me let me try. Uh, uh. Okay, I let it go. Try to see if you can. Huh. I don't know how to, I don't know where we are right here. Maybe so. if, uh, if you change my try. status as not a co-host anymore. I will try to get this for me, just so we can, we can check and then I can stop. Can you see mine? Now I'll stop sharing. Great. Oh, it went back to you. I think you got stuck, Monica. <laughs> what if I share this? Hold you're on. on mute, you're on mute, Monica. Uh, Mike, you got this to start. I, now I, I found it. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So what happened to the fifth dimension? Here's what happens with this dimension. Like this. Ah. Remove link. Oh, I'm going to start link here. I'm going to take this link, I guess. Copy it. And... And go there. Do you see the UC links page now? Not Hold yet. On. No. You have to stop sharing and start sharing again, Mike. Well, do a do a um a show, a, a PowerPoint show, the little icon down the bottom, and the link will work. 
Uh, thank you, Andy, but I don't see it. So. I think um, because you opened another page, you have to stop sharing. Yes. Share again, and yes. then we can see that page. Or as Andy suggested, you have those two options. Uh, you can also make the presentation and click on the link. On the bottom of the PowerPoint uh, window, there's a little square with an arrow. I think that's the one that uh, means you're actually going to do the PowerPoint show instead of looking at the design page. Okay. So you're going to have the PowerPoint. Um, down the bottom, uh, the little icon, I think it's there. On the right hand side, see. Andy? Yeah. And it makes a PowerPoint show. That's it, I think. There. Now the link will work. Is that true? No. Oh, it's gone to a different page still. Um, I think, Mike, I think you should stop sharing and find the page and start yeah. sharing again. And that yeah. usually works. Okay, I've stopped sharing. And I see Alina, Alina. I see Alina Lampert. Oh. <laughs> share Hello. again. Do share again, but pick the window with the web page on it. Uh, of course, it's no longer there. So it's like... Uh, <laughs> You copy the link so you can copy paste it in the browser. That's probably true. Um, all right. Oh, here we go. Collective problem solving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. This is it. So no, no, it's uh, uh, still yeah. a page. You you should share the browser with the page. Share the browser with the page. I'll, I'll, I'll share something I found, Mike, and then you let me know if this is the page or not, okay? Okay, okay, sure. Is this the one? I'm still seeing the page I was looking at, of course. So yes. On. We can't see it, Eleanor. Yeah, Monica, uh -oh, we can. can't see it. You My cannot? screen sharing is paused. Stop share. We still see. Yeah, ah, now, you... now we see Monica's. Now we can see it. Is this the one, Mike? Yes, that's the one. Okay. So it, for a long answer to what's happened to it, what you can do is, uh, if you like, go to About Us, upper left. Who we are? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, the fifth dimension that's described in the paper, I'm going to answer the question without, uh, I can't control this. What it would be nice is if you could find a list of all of the programs, like it may be, it may be that you can click on university and P12 students. Is that clickable? No. On the top, there is a link to program programs on the top. Well, that could be right. And so if you scroll down this, right. So this would be a number of the various kinds of programs. So this is what has happened to the fifth dimension, right? So the, the activities that you read about written up in 19, let's call it, let's call it the year 2000, was uh, approximately, uh, 1970, 1980. It was approximately 38 years into the project. It's been going for 38 years, I think. Uh, oh, and it can't be, that can't be right. After sense, 20, excuse me, it's been going for 20 years. Uh, and uh, it, the, it, it boasted uh, a couple of sites at San Diego, it had grown to include sites at Whittier, uh, other parts of San Diego, uh, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Berkeley, and so on. All of the branches of the University of California and some other places around the world. Uh, and what happened once well, it, it, it was continuing to grow at a slow rate with some dying off, 
tried and failed and some sprouting new generations. And in 2000 and I think it was 2006, uh, the University of California underwent, uh, or it was actually 1996, the University of California underwent a major um, uh, change when the voters rejected affirmative action and keeping diverse populations at, in the University of California was made almost impossible. Uh, and it expanded, it, it created fifth dimension networks and three more generations perhaps now, or four more generations of programs that keep the basic organizational features of an ideology of the fifth dimension, but implement them in a variety of different ways in a variety of settings. And here it would be helpful for me to be able to show my screen. And let me just end the slideshow, click the exit, huh, okay. I stopped sharing so you can okay. share yours, okay, yeah. Mike? Yeah, I wanted to do that. Well, I, I don't see the, that's uh, interesting. I don't see the PowerPoint that has a point I want. Oh, there it is. Um, so, no, I, I just, darn. I just, I got rid of the, the diagram. What you, if you can see, if you can see my hands and I'm gonna put it up like this. If you can see my hands, what's, what started was that we created a model fifth dimension in a very hothouse special situation after school with children who are failing in school and we invented it. And we saw great promise in it. The teachers liked it, the parents liked it, but it couldn't continue. It was supported by research. So we had to stop. And it took two or three years before we had another opportunity to try to start it again, finding people to sponsor it. And when we did, it was always, this is where I wish I had the proper diagram, but think of a triangle, easy for all of us to think of a triangle, right? And in this case, on one side of the triangle is university and their researchers. And another side of the, on the other side of the triangle is the community and their children and the parents at home and institutions for children like the school, but also for after school, right? And so you have this two, you wanna create a partnership, but you have to do something in common. The joint mediate, it's your activity between these two is mediated through your joint activity, doing something together. In this case, creating an ideal environment for children in the after school hours. Well, how are you gonna do that so you can sustain it? It's not enough to go do it again and show that it works and then stop. Do it again and then stop. Do it again because the further you go, the more you'll find out about all the reasons why this hadn't been done before. All the reasons why this better way of doing things, this ideal way of doing things can't be done. But in order to make that work, you have to have people feel the ideal. If they don't feel the ideal, they don't know what the hell you're talking about, right? And they can imagine whatever they like. So what has happened is that most fifth dimensions died off, but each time one or two of them have offspring in some new environment that you'd never encountered something like that before. And they tried to make it happen again, but the conditions have changed. The technology has changed. The particular people, are, things have changed, right? So each generation has to reconstruct the, the ideal, but the ideal itself now has changed a little bit. In abstract terms, it's the same. Our children are our future. 
Agreed. So we'll do something so our fu children's future is good. Agreed. But now what's good? People from a university probably don't have the same idea as people from a community organization worried about after school activities, low cost, not so academic and so on. So you have to organize it so it's beneficial to both. Not just beneficial, you're not doing missionary work on your community, right? What you're doing is working with the community to figure out a way to solve your problem and their problem. What's your problem at the university? Lousy education of social science students who are going to become professionals. No clearly linked practical experience. No theoretically guided practical experience. So that when you go out of the university, you can answer questions on an examination, but you don't know what to do. You don't know how to think more expansively. So the salute the, for the university, they must value this experience for their purposes, the education of their students, the promotion of research for the community, but always creating the next generation of people who are given the resources to do this kind of work. Do it over time. What's happened with the fifth dimension is that the early ones, like the one I did, it was very domesticated. Adorno would look at it and say, oh yeah, it's all very nice, but there's nothing transformative about this, right? And over time, you see the transformation that was as big narrows down it's paired away slowly. You go along to get along, you compromise. And so it turns out your utopia is not the total ideal, but everybody likes it. And uh, my way of uh, uh, characterizing this shorthand is that to say this, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? The fifth dimension is not a free lunch. The fifth dimension is a very inexpensive lunch. If people cooperate a little bit to make it happen and the children like it and the parents think it's nutritious. Okay, that you can sustain as an environment, the best possible environment you could create and always try, of course, it doesn't work. It breaks down. All these things happen. Every generation has to reconstruct it. And the culture only lives in its reconstruction. What human beings do is to modify their environments to be able to continue to live in them. That's what we do as human beings. So uh, uh, what's very interesting is that recent fifth dimensions, Fifth dimension since COVID, people asked about COVID in particular, before COVID as well, uh, became more radical than I could have done in my generation. Now, how is that possible? Well, because it was all, mine was domesticated. But when a new one comes up with a new generation, where the possibilities of the last generation, people of color who are in charge of their fifth dimensions, wherever it is that they're doing it, right? Then the conditions have changed and the radical potential that could not be implemented at an earlier time now can be. And so if you go to the UC Links page and you look at the projects, you'll see projects that are no longer just building, uh, there are serious uh, reasons to do the fifth dimension the way we did it, separate topic, right? But however that is, there's something about the way in which you've propagated, you've reproduced a form of practice that can be sustained in these hybrid systems now when they couldn't be previously. And it's just a fact. So we're seeing them spread slowly, 
this virus does not grow rapidly and it doesn't affect, infect all parts of society. Many parts are immune to it. They throw it out as soon as they see it because they know they don't want it. It's alien to them, right? On the other hand, it's in, if you look at the map, it's, is there like 30 of these in the world now? Maybe. And each one may be domesticating, but each one is changing and its potential is showing again. And that for me is very important lesson about the long durée that you, that you have to be there at the beginning to understand the conditions, to understand the conceptions as an idea, to give birth to the practice, which is a new set of ideas, right? Then you study the lifespan of that activity in society over cultural historical time. So I think there's an enormous amount to be learned by doing this, but it requires uh, some infrastructure. And the big question is, how do you keep the infrastructure light and flexible and shareable? How do you remain and mobile? Uh, now, I, that's a very long answer, but it's, it, it answers sort of several questions. I think several questions at once. F F Fernanda. Yes, please. Can I just comment something, Mike? Because somebody also asked in the chat and I would like uh, to explore these ideas, uh, this idea a little bit more as well. Because when you mentioned to know the ideal, this is something that is very connected to the concept of the viable unheard of that Paulo Freire talks about. And also the idea that we have to, to, get, to get a feeling of the thing that we want so that we can want and work on it so that it can happen. Is that okay. what you mean? Because okay. for us, it's very essential that students can play with an imaginary reality, but a reality that they can transform into something viable. Mm -hmm. And although it's never heard before, it is viable because they imagine it. And yes. so together they can construct it. Right. Is they can embody it. Right. They can embody it. Um, I'm not, I, I, I think that people who are thinking the way I'm thinking have, this is, my ideas are not new. My ideas are absolutely not new. They're just my rediscovery of the ideas of people who've gone before. And Ferrari is an extremely important person in that uh, overall world of people that had a model of doing it. We could talk about Ferrari separately, but I think it's probably, there is a very close relationship between those two. And that, and that I think we totally agree. It's the same, it's the same uh, principle as why the experiment with blind deaf people in Zagorsk was so important. Uh, because it's, it's an embodiment of an alternative reality that society can achieve if it, we, one would think. You could at least challenge society to achieve it because it shows you the possible. And then you want to be able to have that be a possible that's productive now. <laughs> It can't wait to be productive, right? It has to continue to, it's a living process. So you can't, uh, you can't freeze it and bring it out again later, something like that. Uh, so I, I think there are a lot of common ideas here, right? A lot. The issue is how do you rise to the concrete in your circumstances? That's what's so hard. Right. How do you embody them in those circumstances? How do you keep them alive in those circumstances? Right. Um, and um, so I, to me, that's a deeper personal reason for engaging in this form of activity. But um, we're trying to do this in a way that is professionally acceptable. Right. We have to do this in terms of our disciplines uh, or or our virus does not penetrate. Our virus doesn't start to interact. Um, so for me, I'm very uh, uncertain about talking about this with you all, except that you work in classrooms. You want to do things differently in classrooms. So how is it, under what conditions can you move the bars of the iron cage you're in to create 
the form of activity that you would associate with liberation, right? That's how do you do that? However, people define liberation because people, there's different words and different senses that, but, but to expand, to uh, have more opportunities in life and, and so on. Um, so I, there's that set of questions. I, I, how, we, still have, uh, we still have time. Uh, we should perhaps go to another question uh, that I have not taken up. Um, yeah. Here. Before before we go to the next question, I think it's we need to change translators. The one in yes, the one in charge, the ones in charge of subtitles. Is it VV now? Okay. I'll and then I'd like to know if the audience has some questions. Okay. So, yeah, Elina. No, no, they know they have to have questions. Otherwise, I volunteer them. <laughs> well, it's a it's a quick question. It's about I don't want to be lost in words, but uh, when we do create in environments for going beyond who we are and, and transforming the restrictive machines of schooling where teachers and children are together. Um, sometimes reconstruction does not necessarily lead to transformation because mm -hmm. it, reconstruction can stay, I think, within the same parameters and be safe, <laughs> uh, when, at least the way I understand reconstruction. So sometimes it requires additional effort um, of transforming those contexts uh, of, of learning and teaching and being uh, for people to dare to imagine unsafe actions uh, that will lead to transformation. So I, I guess it's a comment about being sort of specific when you engage in, in, in the difference of action that is reconstructions versus transformation. Well, that's exactly what Adorno said. You just said again what Adorno said, which is that that all efforts at serious change are doomed because either they will be domesticated so that they people will want to stay safe, domesticated place space is safe, uh, or they'll be crushed. That strikes me as he was observing things in Germany in 19 whenever. And we can observe it anywhere in the world today. You anyway, you anywhere in the world today you like. So uh, it's of course trying to work in the spaces, the not entirely safe spaces, right? Uh, so all of this is very consistent with a kind of ecological niche, cultural, socio-cultural, political, ecological niches, trying to find those spaces. When we started the fifth dimension, there was no space for what we did, right? Who would ever think of making serious like engagement with the students in an after-school program around a made-up world that's like some sort of weird combination of play and something else and uh, get the, the, anybody to agree that that would be good for undergraduates to be participating in and getting graded for and becoming good scientists because they're doing it. Who would ever make the room for something like that? So you have to then work in your institution. How did I make the room? I go to my committee at my university and I say, uh, I'm a member of the National Academy of Education in this country. And I look at the education of undergraduates in my university, no chemist, would ever be allowed out of this university to practice their chemistry as a doctor or a pharmacist, none of them, right? Would be allowed out if they didn't have laboratory classes, would they? Never, never, never. Why is it by which pedagogical logic do you arrange it so that no social science student can have such an experience, but they're supposed to go apply their social science? Would you just explain to me your rationale 
uh, provost somebody, so, such and such. And if you bring money with you and you say that, suddenly there is space. Okay, will the space last for three years? Well, yes, beyond three years. That's the, so of course it's a struggle. You have to, you can't just do things if you, <laughs> so we agree entirely, Elena, that's 100% true, but there are these different languages for talking about it that right. lead you to think about it in a little bit different way. So I think what you're saying is completely consistent with what Adorno said, and that's part of the challenge of cultural historical activity theory, if it's going to be useful, is to be able to find the spaces and to exploit the spaces that you find. Right. Zdrava smyšlenia. Common sense. A Cris colocou no chat aqui. Cris, go on. Hi, uh, it's an honor to hear you, Mike. And uh, I was also going to ask about this Adorno position because it feels to me that this is more and more a reality. Uh, every time we try to overcome our uh, contradictions, it seems that they get back at us and they are absorbed by the system in a way that uh, when we see we are deeper and deeper into them. And uh, right now, in a, in a, you talk about an ecological perspective, and you did say that uh, men adjust their activities or the way of living in order to create the possibility of living in this world. But what we have been doing with this world is actually uh, um, making it impossible for us to live in it, okay? So we're creating, we are acting on it to be able to live in it. And at the same time, we are uh, depleting uh, the, the very conditions that uh, we need to live in it. That's correct. So uh, how can our small utopic actions in our very restricted uh, contexts overcome the power of the greedy and the I yeah, don't know. Well, right. Uh, I think that's they were that's what they were asking at the origins of Christianity and so on. So it's like um, and next week Andy Blunden, who is who knows a lot about social movements, will tell you the answers to your questions, right, Andy? <laughs> it's it's very difficult. Uh, I so, wish. Yes, right, exactly. So uh good day. And so uh, I, I think there is where a lot of our discussions are at the moment, Chris, that, that uh, it's, it's, it's events like this, even though you know that, that there's a, a system that is looking down on you from above, and if you get to be too big a bug, they're probably gonna try and squash you. So the issue, right, so then how do you, what are the resources of the week in trying to do this and and I, that's beyond my, I think that's beyond all of us. So, so I try to act locally and think globally and I'm very critical in both domains and then I try to act positively in both domains. And I don't know what more one can do, especially at the age of 83, which is I'm, I'm coming up on here. So it's like, you know, um, but I do think the international work, for me personally, constantly to internationalize. Elena knows I'm constant with the Russians. I'm always saying, what, where, why is there no serious discussion here? Why? There's no technical. It used to be there were technical reasons that I couldn't consult with Alexander Luria about some research problem. There is no such technical reason now, none. But serious discussion, especially public serious discussion is very rare extremely difficult to organize. We can talk about, so I'm actually giving a talk in Moscow at some conference on, you know, uh, digital, digital childhood. And the utopian, the wrong kind of utopian thinking about, you, you know, digital childhood is everywhere. 
and my focus there is on how do you collab how do you allow people to communicate and learn from each other across nations that are in conflict with each other how do we find things that we are we can legitimately work on without you know security forces coming and knocking on our door mm -hmm. and i think there are ways to do that uh, and I think actually Russian developmental psychologists knew very well how to do that, mm -hmm. right? To create spaces where they could create alternative worlds, but they were not spaces that were in the middle of Red Square. They were elsewhere. Right. right. Okay. Uh, Adriane Sensi, you can make your question. And then you, we have a question from Facebook by Kiri Potapov. Hello, um, it's a comment and a question. Um, okay. I was, <laughs> I was thinking about two words, failure and utopia. And this is because some years ago in my PhD research that Fernanda and Monica knows very well, <laughs> I was, uh, this, this was very important to me. We were working with um, formative intervention in a school to support teachers to um, build an inclusive education yes and trying to do this uh, what what we heard we heard they sh we well it was not possible to build this kind of inclusive education and teachers uh, said that um, this kind of inclusion we are trying to to create uh, sounds like utopia and and i was like what we are doing here we are talking about utopias and how can we overcome this idea how can how can things change and um i i realize i know that uh, at school teachers face a lot of difficulties and at that time this transformation uh, was not possible but I now I think uh, is this transformation possible nowadays? Um, if we consider that contradictions are getting bigger and bigger and bigger in Brazil, things are are getting stronger. So how can we uh, work uh, on this? Um, creating ideal, I don't know, how can we work together to overcome this situation, to um, bring utopia real? <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't have an answer, but mm -hmm. I, I still work on it. I still work with teachers to, <laughs> to discuss, discuss an inclusion and try to mm -hmm. make it possible. Right. But uh, we face many, many contradictions. Now, like nowadays, we have these uh, online classes um, with students with disabilities that are very, very hard. That, so if we had problems in, in, in common times, nowadays, they, they are bigger. So I am thinking about this, <laughs> how to to look to utopia and how to create conditions to achieve some place together, something like that. So um, there, one of the last questions that people, that people, there was a, a commentary um, in the questions uh, that I thought was uh, relevant to your question. So let me just, uh, It, it was the idea that the the schools was a place of liberation. How do you, and by my analysis, historically from its origins in all of its manifestations in the modern world, but also in the ancient world, that schooling has never been uh, a institution of liberation. It's always been an institution of governmentality and control. Uh, and so I think that's a really major, that's a really major issue. And um, 
I don't, it's like we referred in the Brown and Cole paper to the work of Elizabeth Stuckey on the violence of literacy. And the violence associated with literacy we see all over the world today. It's not hard to find. It's uh, quite quite visible. So I think what you're talking about is, is understanding things at a very local level and then trying to understand how that local level is constructed at the municipal level and the municipal level and so on. And you get back to social movements beyond any environment that you can control. So if you want to con move toward or construct something that's an ideal that deviates significantly, right? You're going to have to have a lot of extra resources at the beginning in order to make the push and so to speak, implant yourself in this other formation and then be able to have enough energy to work out the conditions under which you could live there. We began working after school because the logic of our research in the school classroom was incompatible with the work of the teachers. The teachers kicked us out of their classrooms. They did not want to be observed doing what they knew was wrong, but was the best they could do. And we could not do any better than they could. If you'd put me in their shoes, it would have been no better than they did. All right. So uh, you you can't you can't blame the teachers. You can't blame any. You have to blame quotes the system. But you can't. You are this part of the system. So what part of the system can you move? I have around? that suit too, actually. Right. Uh, you have to band together with others, which you're doing. And what I did in order to pursue the line of activity is I moved after school and I moved out of the school. But when I moved out, I had no idea what would work. Try a youth club, try a church, try a school after school, try a library, try the soccer club, try whatever, it doesn't matter, some civic organization, something there that cares, that, that believes our children are our future. And then figure out, can we work out a common future that you think is a better solution, a better future for your children and for you? Can we do that collaboratively across institutions so that we can put together the resources of the two institutions to make the thing happen? And then can we sustain it? That's the challenge. That's the ongoing work. And most of the time you lose. So when you lose, what you're doing is you're pushing up the, pushing out the walls of the system that you're in as far as you can. And then you let it fall, okay? It stops or you have to let it fall. And you watch all the pieces as they fall down and you say, next time I know that piece is there so I'll get up and I'll do it again. And now I know something new. And you do it again. It's called critical activity. Okay, I have two more questions. One is by Kirill Potapov. Yes. And another one by Aiding, Aiding Ball. So by Kirill, I very much like the contrast between the, this Nietzschean strand of critical theory and Mike's wider chat constructive approach the other side where Adorno was a pessimist in his use of ideas from psychotherapy. Yeah. In this time of mental health crisis, I wonder if fifth dimension approaches and others like it might find a new, a new niche. Did it improve health at all? And then he adds, I'll be using aspects of it in my classroom for this end. So I hope so. And then Aidy's questions. One, 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 one question. at a time. One at a yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great idea. So yes, 100% true. It's like a form of play therapy, a particular form of play therapy. And um, I can tell you, I have used it for therapeutic 
purposes, but only uh, <laughs> these Russians, Slut China, only opportunistically, right? So for example, with an undergraduate, I have to say being in a fifth dimension is a very nice place to be. That just generally, pe people are there, they're having fun. They're, they enjoy themselves because the undergraduates are told, they say, hey, how much should I help the children with these various things? They're always told as little as you can, but enough so that you and the child are having a good time. All right. So that's like a criterion, again, this sort of uh, utopian kind of uh, goal that's right, you know, standard. It's just boom, boom, boom. It's always right there. Are you having a good time? Uh, a, wo a wo young woman, uh, 20, 21 years old in my class, came to me after three weeks of school and said, I have to drop out of UCSD. I'm too depressed. My boyfriend just what? killed himself. Okay. And of course, I like, and I, I asked her, I said, well, what, what, when you're during the day, what, what, where are you spending time so that you can put this aside and somehow enjoy yourself and forget yourself and create a little space for yourself? And she said, well, the only class I like is coming to your class is going to the fifth dimension. So um, I organized uh, for this girl to take all of her classes in the fifth dimension. I could do that. I mean, there are ways to manipulate the, how the curriculum works so you could do that. And at the site, uh, there was a little boy who was giving her some trouble and uh, was making life a little bit difficult for her. And we taught her how to be an expert on a couple of the games that this little boy liked. And after another week in the fifth dimension, the little boy loved this undergraduate and complained when she wasn't there and she recovered. It's kind of like the experiments of Harry Harlow with the monkeys who have been very, very traumatized by not being raised with uh, real mothers. And they're put with real mothers who are themselves upset, who have been raised this way. And if they, they hold on tight, and if they're not killed, then the mothers are cured. Right? So I think that there's, in the interactions, yes, of course you could do this. Of course you could do this, but the particulars are not playing a particular game in a you know arcade game or any one thing, but it's by being engaged in a world with somebody and gaining again the feeling of of of, hum, of positive human contact. Again, you have to experience it to know what it is that you're trying to get. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't know. It's like always with zone of proximal development and riding a bicycle. You're inside a system which get, allows you to feel the feeling that you need in order to be able to guide yourself in how to balance yourself. I don't, my hands are not high off this darn screen. Okay, so again, my father or me with my brother or repeatedly, you have people who create environments that coordinate somebody else, a child, with a possible future that makes them feel good and in control. Like, you, and you let go of the bike and they look around the first time they may fall, but they know what they're getting up again to do. They have the feedback that they can use. So they're trying, it's, going, it's getting closer to the goal. And I think it's, that's a very general kind of principle, but the, the design of it, it's very difficult and, you know, uh, certainly for psychotherapy, enormously difficult.
the same, I think the same principles. Uh, and who else, who, somebody else had a question? Monica? Aiding, Aiding Ball. Oh, he asks, Aiden. Aiden, Aiden, yeah. sorry, Aiden, yeah, yeah. yes. What is your utopia for chat? Um, I don't know. I, my, my utopian chat is um, uh, uh, collections of people like this doing this kind of activity. That is, uh, I, I think that the collectivity, the distributed collectivity uh, that allows us to block various sorts of binaries that uh, hang us up. In the United States, it's extremely difficult to organize male-female discussions in groups, groups across ethnic and social class boundaries about serious topics because people really don't know each other well enough and understand each other's lives, right? In order to be able to do that. So creating community is what I think we're doing. Uh, and it's a community with particular values. And uh, it's, uh, it's always in danger. It's been in danger. It's always in danger. It's just part of humanity that uh, you're trying to defeat evolution. We can't defeat evolution. <laughs> we're just part of evolution, but we're struggling against the inequalities and all of the things, the COVIDs and everything else that selectively cast out, you know, parts of humanity. And it's narrowing down and narrowing down. It's very dangerous for a species to narrow down and narrow down. That's it. That we are. We're not. We're. We're not rational as a species. We're. We're organisms, biological organisms as a species. So. Thank you so much, Mike. I think we don't have time anymore, Faye. We have five minutes, so we need to. Yeah, grow. I, yeah perhaps Mike could leave us a message that he thinks is something that he would like to share. And uh, be, although you have said so many things that already, I mean, Make us breathe a little bit uh, at this moment. I think the most important thing of this moment is that because we are together, we feel stronger. And I think that the examples, the concrete examples and the concrete ideas you presented, they are very essential for us to feel like, well, breathing is something that we are in need very much nowadays yes. in these COVID times. So, having an opportunity to be here with everyone. We are breathing together like one single body. And I think it's very yeah. essential what you said. Well, so what would you like to leave for us? And just um, before you, you say your last words, because people will leave, não esqueçam de preencher o formulário quem quiser certificado. O, o link tá aí do lado no chat. Those of you who need a certificate, you have the link in the chat. Please go there and and, and fill it in. Posso complementar, Fê? Sim. É, vocês vão preencher o formulário, vocês vão ser redirecionados para um site para vocês fazerem um preenchimento, né? É, pra, com todas as informações. E depois do evento, o certificado vai ser enviado, tá? Então, é, é só isso que vocês precisam fazer, tá bom? Mesmo quem está no, no Facebook também pode fazer o mesmo procedimento, tá? Ok. Up to you, Mike. I think that we should be creating international courses. Yes. It's been like in the books for so long. It's so I, easy. It's so. I it, have it, been it, doing it. I understand that. A, a lot of people have been doing it, but they don't know that the other people are doing it. Exactly. Nobody, nobody in a Zoom class should have to teach all the sessions. You should be able to cooperate. You should be able to reduce your own workload by cooperating. Same principle as the fifth dimension, right? You need, you need the two resources and institutionalize it. People at UCSD can invite professors from elsewhere to lecture in any lecture. People from Sao Paulo, people from Moscow, people from anywhere, they can 
invite anybody from anywhere. Andy Blunden, who you're going to see, has and and we have uh, on the stuff we've done around cultural practices, which and, and uh, XMCA mm -hmm. have enormous amounts of useful material. We need to collect them. We need to curate them. We need to create, you know, uh, lists of them. For that, we need some extra money. I do not believe you could not get extra money to, for doing that. If you were to, to do it collaboratively in a responsible way and not everybody compete with everybody else, you know, not knowing what everybody else is doing. So there are many of these nodes growing up. The Russians are now putting a bunch of money into doing this kind of thing, right? The Chinese are putting a bunch of money into doing this kind of thing. The Americans are all confused. So the rest of the world is right at the moment, trying, trying to recover from this near brush with fascism, right? Near brush. It's not gone away. It's still there. Right. Right. So uh, um, I, I think that if this can be done, it's just that I now, I can't organize such things anymore. My life doesn't permit me. I did that for 50 years, you know, long enough. Uh, but I can contribute to discussions like this. I can also read manuscripts, right? I mean, there are all sorts of things that people can do, but they have to be aware of it and be willing to work collaboratively. And that's hard because we're inside these uh, bureaucratic system, hierarchical bureaucratic systems that constantly undercut our ability to work across generations. So yeah, I think classes and intergenerational classes. Um, there are people around, uh, Anneli Terry Clermont. So there are a lot of people around who have enormous learning. Put it in a can. So you can open the can later and breathe it, right? Like that. I, I think those are good things to do. And I look for follow-up uh, here. And by all means, uh, Fernanda, please have everybody go look at cultural praxis and see, because there's stuff in Portuguese there. With cultural praxis, there's no reason people cannot write in any language they want. Because we can always put up a link to Google Translate or a Yandex can or somebody's translate that will allow us to communicate. It's no longer an excuse. It just has to be cleverly organized. Cleverly organized. Okay, thank you. Bom <laughs> Thank you, thank Mike. You. Obrigada. Parabéns. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Mike. Andy, you, see everyone. you next week. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Lari, Dani, Vivis, well, Val, for the support. Inter. Yes, okay. thank you for the support. And thank you so, so, so much, Mike, for accepting our invitation. I look forward see to you around. I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, see you yeah. around. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Good people. night. Ciao, Stay then. safe. Take good care of yourselves. Bye bye. Thank you. Até a próxima, gente. See bye. you next week with Andy Blunden. See you. Thank you, Vivi. Muito bom, meninas, na interpretação. Uf. Muito bom, Fernanda. Parabéns. Beijinho. <laughs> Obrigada. Oh, Até mais. Que bom que você está aí. A Luciane é a nossa próxima. Ai, Adri. Luciane. Oh, oh, a Luciane. Parabéns. A Agradeço. Eu, vou, eu vou falar com você. A, Lu, a Lari que vai organizar o seu, Luciane. Ela ah, vai entrar em contato para a gente poder fazer o, o diálogo prévio que a gente faz sempre. Ah, ok. Tudo, vai ser muito bom. A gente eu quero mais... te enviar um texto. Você parou? Ainda está para mim? Não. Eu vou tirar. Ah, Boa, Lu. Ainda bem que você lembrou. Deixa eu tirar.